What's going on YouTube? It's TH back again with another video. And hey, it's another weekend. That means it's time for another 2023 NFL mock drafts. Hopefully, you guys are excited. We got three rounds coming to you over the next three days. Not all gonna be in this one video. Today we got the first round. Tomorrow we have the second round video coming out to you. And I know Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday, so maybe just add it to your save to watch later. But nonetheless, that's when round three will be coming at you. So hopefully, however you consume this three-round mock draft, hopefully it is pleasurable to you. Um, before we get started, I do want to hit on a couple things before we get started. Um, I do these every week, as noted, another weekend, another mock draft. Uh, so if, you, if you're if you new maybe and you're like, why is he changing this up so much from last week or I hate this fit, I like what he did last week better, or whatever the case may be, just understand I'm not trying to have my content get so stale. You know, there are times where, you know, I'm like, hey, this just makes so much sense. I'm going to keep making this pick. But for the most part, I hate for any person of any fan base to be like, wow, he just keeps doing the same thing. This video isn't for me. So I am trying to mix it up. So that is part of why I am, you know, moving things around. It's not the same video over and over and over again. And also, hey, it's like, early February uh, when this first round video is coming out we haven't even gotten to the Super Bowl yet so part of this also is not necessarily me going full predictive and trying to think of what, what Howie Roseman is going to do what's Brandon Bean going to do this is still me kind of pitching fits player destinations you know, like hey how cool of an offense would this be if this guy was added in or could you imagine these two edge rushers teamed up that would be awesome so you know, give me a little bit of a break there. But nonetheless, as we're going through this, hopefully you guys enjoy. Hit the like button if you do. Subscribe if you're new. If you're a big draft junkie, plenty more content just for you. And of course, comment your thoughts as we go along. Love to know your favorite team, whether you like the pick or not. And as long as you're detailed and not a total jerk about why you liked it or didn't like it, I will respond to your comments. So be sure to leave your thoughts down below. I've already gone ahead and made the... Uh, Pick swap at number one. I had Chicago and Houston trade places just because I haven't actually done Houston at the number one pick um, just yet on the channel. I've done Carolina and Indianapolis, but wanted to get Indian uh, or Houston the opportunity. And then obviously Chicago <clears throat> makes their decision pretty easy what they will do at two. Um, I didn't show it in video to save some time, but also the mockdraftdatabase.com isn't great with their trade, you know, pick for pick uh, trades. So that's a little disappointing. Ultimately, I think if you were to ask me, this is probably a pick swap and then 33, which for Chicago would be kind of a huge win because that Chase Claypool trade hasn't really aged well. 32 for Claypool as a Steelers fan. I don't know if he's really warranted that price. Uh, so if you got you know a pick swap at one and two and then 33 out of basically just uh, having Houston win week 18, that's a pretty awesome win. But you know, I, I you know the pick for pick swap again isn't one to one here on mockdraftdatabase.com. But nonetheless, that's not really what we're focusing on. Ultimately, I made it a third and a fourth, which I don't think would be the realistic value. But let's go ahead and kick things off with Bryce Young being the number one overall pick. I, I've said for months now that Bryce Young should go number one overall, and that's why. Hey, it's like Chicago, trade the pick. Like, whatever you got to do, trade the pick because Bryce Jones should be the number one player off the board in this draft. And for Houston, it makes all the sense in the world. You're giving D'Amico Ryans an opportunity to see what that offense has uh, in store with a franchise quarterback at the center of it. So, you know, get your head coach higher right, ideally. I loved Ryans as a hire. He was one of the hottest names in the market for a good reason. Uh, so I think they got the head coaching higher right. Now let's go get the quarterback position right. And let's see what Houston can do in the years to come. So then we get to Chicago. I've said many a times before, if they do stick and pick at one, I think Jalen Carter's their guy. So no brainer there at two. It's the the three tech that Matt Eberflus needs in the middle of that defense. And also this is a deep edge class. Uh, so, you know, whether it's day two, some point and then, you know, round two, round three, or even, you know, round four, I think there's going to be some quality edge rushers still on the board that Chicago can address that position a little bit later on. So then we get to the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, yeah, Will Anderson makes all the sense in the world. Uh, I do hope they bring back Zach Allen, uh, but also with J.J. Watt departing, you know, Allen coming back, and I did think he had a career year last year. That's great. That keeps the interior at somewhat of a status quo, but this team needs edge rush big time. Um, and I do plan on addressing linebacker uh, on day three, if my memory serves, or excuse me, in round three uh, of this mock. But I, I, I'd almost really be tempted, especially if they did add Will Anderson, who's 6'2", 245, a little bit of a smaller edge. He plays the run at a really high level. He's one of the best pass rushers in this class straight up. Him and Carter, you know, best non-quarterbacks. All this stuff that's been said a thousand times. Um, I'd love to see them move Zayvon Collins to the other edge rush spot. You know, a bigger, you know, it kind of makes up for what Will Anderson doesn't have in size and strength. Uh, then obviously that would leave a huge hole right in the middle of the defense there inside linebacker. We'll see who the head coach ends up being, what the defensive coordinator and what the defensive scheme calls for. Because if they like a blitzing inside linebacker, hey, maybe Zayvon Collins can just stick there and kind of fill the same role. But at this point, hey, let's just generate pass rush. And they also have Maj Maj Sanders and Cam Thomas. So maybe I'm overreacting a little bit, but... 
I, I think Zayvon Collins might just be better off at edge and, you know, moving Isaiah Simmons to this, you know, nickel corner, uh, you know, nickel role in general has had him get better. So maybe a change of position can unlock Zayvon Collins. But nonetheless, realistically, Maji Sanders, Cam Thomas are your other edges in rotation with Will Anderson if this were to play out. Then we get to the Colts. And I, this is a true coin toss for me. Uh, Stroud and Levis, because so much of what I think Indianapolis is looking for you can make the argument for either one. You know, the size, the arm strength. Stroud has the accuracy for sure. Levis, I don't know why, but he just feels like a cold. He's played under two different NFL offensive coordinators. I'll just go with Stroud this time around. Uh, I feel like I've had enough Colts fans. Uh, it, it's amazing enough. I've either had them only taking Levis or Young. I think this is the first mock on the channel with them taking Stroud. So, you know, it's just kind of a matter of time. And again, I'm trying to change this up a little bit. Please, my Indianapolis fans, that feels like who a lot of Colts fans want. So if you are an Indy fan, let me know who is your quarterback of preference this draft cycle. So then we get to the Seattle Seahawks at five. Going to do something a little different here. I'm going to give them the edge rusher they just don't have. And Tyree Wilson, also a five-year player in college. So I think somebody who can step in and make some immediate, you know, give you immediate production. So for a team that made the playoffs last year, hey, that's pretty awesome, right? So uh, also Ochenna Nwosu, Boye Mafe, a little bit smaller from the edge spot. So Tyree Wilson getting someone who's 6'6", 280, kind of just feels like the body type they don't have. Guy who can win with power and arm, or arm length. Also, I think when getting into passing situations can kick inside. So that way you can have Mafe, Ochenna Nwosu, and uh, Tyree Wilson out on the field at the same time. So makes sense from a lot of different perspectives. And the number five pick, I mean, obviously if you're Seattle, like having the number five pick, it's just, you know, it's, it's not even your selection. You were playing with house money by nature. But yeah, I don't know. None of the value at five really strikes me as like surefire. Like, you know, like Miles Murphy, it's like, yeah, well, it's a little bit of a work in progress. And even Tyree Wilson, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's good, but I don't love it. So it's, it's amazing. The fact that this isn't even Seattle's pick, this shouldn't like, I shouldn't even really be worried about it, but it's always like, man, I just can't find that exact right fit. So if you're a Seahawks fan, let me know who should be the number five overall pick if y'all do hold on to that selection. Because, kind of on that same note, we're going to have a trade here. We're going to have Detroit move back a handful of spots. This is another one that I've been trying to get into my uh, mock drafts because I do think this is realistic. Now, again, the trade consideration is not necessarily one-to-one. So we're just going to make this a three and a four. We're not even covering the fourth round. So one of those third, or the only third rounder Carolina has is good. Going to go to Detroit, uh, and this will allow uh, Carolina to take Will Levis. So again, you know, I've had Carolina fans who were like, absolutely no, I hate Will Levis. Look, I I've much more in the camp of like the NFL consideration when they look at Will Levis, not to say that I'm smarter than any of you, because that is certainly not the case. I, I just see the traits. I see the tools. I see the upside. Uh, and and I I'm, I'm very partial, you know, to players like this. Josh Allen's the everyone player in my 2018 draft board. You know, I, I loved Justin Herbert coming out of Oregon. You know, these types of guys naturally capture my attention. So it might be a little bit higher than uh, or on Levis than most of you, and that's totally fine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Carolina's looking for that future franchise guy. So whether it's Stroud who goes four or Levis, I, I think if they move up to six, they being Carolina, to nab the other guy, Stroud or Levis, it makes a ton of sense. Because, uh, you know, same thing we were talking about with Houston earlier. Got the head coaching hire, right? I love the Frank Reich hire. Now it comes down to getting that upgrade at quarterback. And, you know, I, I just did the fix to the franchise for the Carolina Panthers, man. I I think if you legitimately give this team a solid boost in quarterback play, it doesn't even have to be like they're going from Darnold to Aaron Rodgers or anything like that. I think if they just get a sizable boost up from you know what they had last year with Darnold and, and Baker Mayfield looking rough and P.J. Walker up and down, I think this team could be in the playoff mix. Part of that is the NFC South is rough, but... Part of that is also like DJ Moore, stud. Like, love that offensive line in the direction they're heading. Uh, I'm also excited about, you know, Terrence Marshall Jr., LaVisca Chenault, specifically in a Frank Reich-led offense. And then I think there's some talent in the backfield as well. The defense has a ton of young pieces to be excited about. So I think there's a lot working in Carolina's favor. So getting that quarterback right, uh, I think, is the last domino to fall. And then this team can start being really, really scary. Next up, we get the Las Vegas Raiders, and we're going to go ahead and go offensive tackle. Peter Skaronsky, I have tried to, you know, veer away from this, but, you know, now it's a matter of time. It, it does make sense, right? Like, Jermaine Illuminor is a free agent. I think he looked pretty good down the stretch last year, but no guarantee you bring him back. Also, he's 28, so you might have just gotten the best football in his career. I mean, you know, Illuminor has not done much else uh, so far in his NFL career. Maybe he's peaking or maybe you already saw it. Uh, so Peter Skaronsky, I think, could be a plug-and-play right tackle. He could also be an upgrade there at left guard. Maybe you're moving Dylan Parham then into center. Um, the only thing unfortunate about this pick is I think Colt Miller is a really good football player, and I like him at left tackle. So really, no matter what, Peter Skaronsky is going to have to change position somewhat. Uh, you're taking him at seven. You're looking for value, so you're going to probably play him at right tackle. Uh, but nonetheless, whether it's 
guard tackle, you're getting an upgrade there somewhere across the offensive line. Um, and now the Raiders become a really fascinating team. You know, I, I'll kind of talk about it a little bit. We are going to go quarterback in tomorrow's video, so I'll hit on this again a little bit then. But man, I, I did not buy the Aaron Rodgers to Vegas, you know, kind of hype that, that started to surface initially. But man, I don't know. Maybe it's Aaron Rodgers just kind of having fun with, you know, me and other folk that are just curious to where he's going. But I don't know. Vegas feels more plausible now than ever, uh, in my opinion. So maybe it is maybe it is something they can do. And if the Raiders can get Rodgers and still hold on to seven, that would be such a win here. So I just want to talk about that. You know, obviously at the time of me recording this, nothing major has happened. But uh, yeah, I'm starting to buy into this Rodgers to Vegas uh, hype a little bit more, which is, uh, I, you know, I really thought they were, you know, I thought that was all kind of a smoke screen just a handful of weeks ago. Anyways, let's move on. Let's talk about the Atlanta Falcons. I'm going to go Miles Murphy here. I went Brian Branch last mock, wanted to change it up. Uh, but I do think edge is a huge area of focus for this team. Miles Murphy, inside out versatility. So, uh, you could get into pass rush situations or passing down situations where you can have D'Angelo Malone, Arnold W. Ketty, who you drafted last year, out on the field. Murphy can kick inside, and maybe him and Grady Jarrett. Your pass rushing, you know, tackles, D tackles, if you will. You know, if you're going, you know, four man rush and a nickel or a dime defense, I think, you know, a line of Ebiketti, Murphy, Grady Jarrett, and D'Angelo Malone, that's eh, kind of a scary, you know, four to have coming at you if you're an offense. So, uh, like this a ton. Uh, Atlanta's tricky because, again, NFC South's kind of open right now. And really, they kind of come down to what they're going to get at quarterback, but they need to upgrade all three levels of that defense. So getting Miles Murphy is a good step in the direction. Also, the timeline could match up. That's again where this gets a little tricky because Atlanta could surprise teams. And, you know, hey, I didn't think they'd go seven and 10 last year. They could be a surprising nine and eight this upcoming year. And, you know, Murphy, I think it's just going to take a year or two before he really hits his stride. So realistically, you're hoping to get some high level run defense right away, but then in a year or two's time, be able to unlock what is there as a pass rusher. Next to the Detroit Lions, they move back from six to nine, garner an extra pick out of it, uh, and now they're going to get uh, their choice of corner. Let's go Devon Witherspoon today. To me, the best uh, man press corner in the class, and that is what Aaron Glenn wants to do. Uh, and it does seem like he's going to be back as a DC. He's now out of the running for the Cardinals head coaching job. So um, this is not only a boost to that secondary, but hopefully a boost to Jeff Okuda, who they're going to have to make a decision on, right? Like that fifth year option is staring them in the face, and I still think the potential's there. Looked a little better last year. Maybe making him a CB2 is, is the last little step you need. And, and by adding Devon Witherspoon, making the assignment easier for Okuda, you can then justify picking up that fifth-year option. But that is going to be a fascinating decision for Detroit to make. So, you know, that's where, you know, I kind of pondered even going a second corner in this draft because what if Okuda doesn't take that step forward? What if Okuda looks rough again this year? Then you're not picking up that fifth-year option and now you're looking for two starting corners. Witherspoon can fill one of those, but then what about the other? So uh, really interesting team to watch from that cornerback standpoint. Let's get some immediate help here with Devon Witherspoon, who I think if I had to take any corner and, you know, I had an NFL team just, you know, up and ready and they're going to play tomorrow, I think Devon Witherspoon would be the corner I'd take out of this class to have as my CD1. Let me get to the Philadelphia Eagles. I have done this once before, and I don't think it was well-received by Eagles fans when I uh, did it. So sorry, you're going to probably be annoyed by this. But look, B. John Robinson's going top 16. Uh, I think he's going to go top half the first round. It's just where, you know, uh, and I think for Philadelphia, kind of like what we talked about with Seattle, you're playing with house money here. This is not your selection. This came virtue or came courteous of the New Orleans Saints for that trade up last year to get Chris Alave. So take advantage of that. Uh, you still have your pick at 31 where you can address an area of need and you can get Bijan Robinson. We'll see if they bring back Miles Sanders and, and, and Boston Scott. But those guys have kind of just kind of, they understand their role in that offense. I think they're really efficient within it. But at the same time, like I think about Nick Sirianni and Shane Steichen and what they got out of, you know, Boston Scott and Miles Sanders. And I'm like, well, how about we give them someone who's cheaper than re-signing both those guys and by far the best pure runner in this draft class who could legitimately play slot 30 to 40% of the time. Like that sounds like a pretty awesome pairing there. So again, going back to what I said off top, like part of this, you know, especially in February when we're doing these mock drafts, I'm playing with fun fits, and I want to see B. John Robinson behind maybe the best offensive line in the NFL. Them in Detroit kind of immediately stick out. Uh, let me get Bijan behind that line, but also in an offense with a great play caller, Stike and Sirianni, kind of the masterminds behind it all. Has its quarterback, you know, at least for the time being, you know, assuming extensions worked out this offseason for Hurts. Uh, and then also great wide receivers like this guy will have one on ones both in the pass game, but also because this team can do so much through the air. It's hard to slow down their run game. And, you know, as good as Miles Sanders and Boston Scott have looked, Bijan's better. Bijan's the best running back prospect to me since Adrian Peterson, which is crazy because I, I said the same thing about Saquon Barkley. But I, I would say Bijan's a little bit ahead of even Saquon. So I know if you're an Eagles fan, you're saying how Roseman doesn't draft safeties, he doesn't draft linebackers, he doesn't draft running backs in the first round. I hear you. I understand you. 
It's not necessarily what I'm predicting to have happen, but dude, could you imagine Bijan in this offense? I mean, they could win the Super Bowl. We're a couple days away from finding out if they are the you know the team hoisting Lombardi. Add Bijan to the mix. That is insane. Anyways, let's talk about the Tennessee Titans now. And, you know, I've been saying for months now that uh, Taylor Lewan makes all the sense in the world to be a cut casualty. Uh, and he's basically confirmed the same thing. He's talking about how it's almost certain that he's not going to be back next year. So, yeah, with Dennis Daly staring me in the face as a potential starting left tackle, last week I went Quentin Johnston. I think that left tackle spot is going to be something you have to address. We're going to stick on the offensive line, too, with a later pick in this mock. So uh, be sure to come back day two, day three, uh, or round two, round three, uh, when I do address that inter-offensive line. But, yeah, there's some work to be done on that old line Paris Johnson Jr., the OT1 for me in this class, 6'6", 315. He's got the size. He's got the footwork. And first-year starter at, at tackle, that is, this year at Ohio State. He looked really, really good. And I've said this plenty of times, too. The fact that Ohio State shoehorned him in at guard two years ago they're desperate to get their five best offensive linemen on the field, and Paris Johnson Jr. was one of them. That, to me, signals like, hey, if I'm an NFL team, that's the guy I want to find a way to get on my offensive line. So if I'm the Titans, if I'm a Titans fan here, I'm loving this pick. Texans at pick 12. Going to do something a little different here. Lucas Van Ness, I totally see this live. I think edge is more than plausible here. I've had Miles Murphy fall to 12, and I think that could be game. Uh, but, you know, I'll be going wide receiver heavy here. I went corner last week, but this team needs edge bad. Like, they needed edge yesterday. Uh, so, a guy who has inside-out versatility in uh, Van Ness. Good explosiveness off the line. Uh, plays with a ton of strength. Uh, and also a retro sophomore, so someone who's a little younger. Uh, allows you to, ideally, you know, tap into more potential. And, you know, I think this team is still a year or two away. A year or two away. Let me talk proper English now. But I think that kind of allows Van Ness to, again, a little bit on the younger side, maybe kind of fully grow into his potential. So he might hit the ground running, which would be awesome for Houston, or it may take a year or two, which as long as he gets there, it's awesome for Houston. So Rowan, quarterback and edge here in the first round, and then we'll address some of those other uh, major areas where I think this team could improve in tomorrow and Sunday's video. Next, the New York Jets. I'm going to go Broderick Jones, which this guy, I feel like there's no player with more variance in my mock drafts than Broderick Jones. I've had him go all the way down to like 31 to Kansas City, and I've now had him go as high as 13 to the Jets. Uh, here, it's just case okay, skaronsky has gone, Paris Johnson Jr. is gone. I do think off the tackle makes the most sense here in the first round. Simpson, you know, Trent Simpson, the linebacker from Clemson, maybe, but 13 feels a little rich. Safety, Brian Branch could be fun, uh, so I wouldn't hate that here, but I'm going to stick with Broderick Jones to me. Having that flexibility based off what they're going to do with Makai Becton is the immediate need for me, so once we get through free agency and we see a potential trade, if it were to come to fruition, that'll give me a little bit more insight, or if they decide, hey, you know, Makai Becton's our guy, we're not even look at the tackle class, then I'll have that much more information to try to pivot here at 13. Then we get to the New England Patriots at 14, and they're going to get my wide receiver one. Just had the my wide receiver rankings come out. Check it out if you missed it. But Quentin Johnston, I mean, a guy with 4'3 speed, 6'4, uh, a great satellite weapon. You know, I've said plenty of times, and, you know, I say it's semi serious, even though it's a joke, but their most dynamic, you know, player with the ball in their hands is Marcus Jones, and he's their slot corner. I mean, that one touchdown, I can't remember who they were playing, but. They got dogged, but Marcus Jones had their one you know, offensive score. And it's because they just don't have anybody dynamic with the ball in their hands, specifically at the receiver position. Quentin Johnston, yes, he's 6'4". Yes, he's a great deep play wide receiver, and he can make stuff happen down the field. He's great in the air. He's great controlling his body. This dude, just as much as he can do all that, he is a satellite weapon. Get the ball to him in space and let him force miss tackles. So, uh, love to see him in a Bill O'Brien offense. And, you know, now we're talking about an offseason where Mac Jones clearly at the forefront. If they go wide receiver at 14 and correctly make an upgraded offensive coordinator, that's clear with the focus in mind of like, all right, we need to make a decision on Mac Jones. So I can only hope, if I'm a Patriots fan, I, again, I try to do all these picks with with the fan base in mind. What pick would excite me? I think Quint Johnston with the offensive coordinator change would probably be the most exciting route that New England could go in round one. But offensive tackle, linebacker, I've gone Brian Branch, Devon Witherspoon if he's available. All those players are certainly live here, except for in this mock where the spoon is already off the board. Next, we get to the Green Bay Packers at 15. Uh, I'm going to go back to my roots here. I took a little bit of a break from it, but Michael Mayer makes a lot of sense to me. Now, I know Green Bay doesn't always, you know, or seems to have uh, a negligence to drafting first round, you know, pass catchers. So I get it. If, if you're saying it from that perspective that Green Bay is just not going to do this, I hear you. But, you know, it's, it's the right move to make. Uh, they need to get an upgrade there because Bob Tunyon's a free agent and even if he wasn't, you could do better. <laughs> so, and, and, and if Rodgers is leaving, you need to put the best ecosystem around Jordan Love possible, who I liked Jordan Love a good bit coming out of Utah State. Again, I like these tools, he traits, he quarterbacks. Some of them work, some of them don't. Uh, but yeah, if you were to add Michael Mayer to the mix with 
Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs and some of those other other young pieces on that offense, all of a sudden becomes a really exciting you know offense to watch next year, even if they don't have Aaron Rodgers. But again, really just comes down to propping up Jordan Love and trying to get the most out of him. I've gone Nolan Smith here. I've had Lucas Van Ness fall to 15. I think those plays are certainly live. So uh, you know, I'm hoping that you know just like Green Bay last year. They hadn't really taken your super old prospect. They draft Devontae Wyatt, who's 24. That was certainly outside the Green Bay way of doing it, the Brian Gutekunst, uh, you know, form of business. I'm hoping that, you know, kind of carries into this year and they do something a little different and draft Michael Mayer because this is this is the fit I want to see. And then we get to Washington at 16. Let's go with those sirens, Torrance. I've done this a couple times. This just screams like Ron Rivera. I want to have a two-to-one run-to-pass ratio. All this stuff I've kind of heard him say. We'll see who they hire as the office coordinator because you know, ultimately they're going to have more say. Uh, but... Nonetheless, this team is just looking for an upgrade there at, uh, at left guard over Andrew Norwell. I believe that was only a one-year contract anyway. So, yeah, plug-and-play starter there at left guard. Kind of fits with the identity of what I what I think Ron Rivera is looking for, uh, which keep in mind not only the head coach but also the GM. So he certainly has a lot of say in the room. So I think Osiris Torrance makes a ton of sense. Would love to see corner. Uh, I think off the tackle could make some sense too. But I do find myself as a big Sam Cosby believer a lot more than most. Um, so I, I think, you know, Charles Leno, yes, he's getting up there in age. I don't think he's that bad at left tackle. And I think Cosby's solid at right tackle and there's something to build on. Uh, but I know some other Washington fans are, are not as optimistic about that tackle duo. So OT could certainly make sense here. But also we have Paris Johnson Jr. off the board. We have Peter Skaronsky off the board. We have Roderick Jones off the board. Not a whole lot of value here. Let's go Osiris Torrance at 16. So we get to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm going to go Christian Gonzalez here. Uh, man, I, I would love to see him. And, you know, again, by a Steelers fan here, this would be a fit that would make me very, very happy. Uh, six foot two, long arms, four three, checks all those athletic measurables that you're looking for in a first round corner. Um, but also just such a fluid mover, man, his ability to flip the hips and go fly to the football. It is rare for someone that size. So Pittsburgh probably primarily a zone heavy squad I, I think while Christian Gonzalez has the body and the technique and certainly the upside to be an awesome man press corner I think he fits really well into what Pittsburgh wants to do in a zone heavy scheme so no matter what I think this is a big time upgrade for Pittsburgh in their cornerback room which a hey, Cam Sutton a free agent this year I don't know what that position looks like long term for Pittsburgh so certainly a huge area that they need to address so then we move on to the Detroit Lions. I'm going to have the end of the slide be Brian Brzee here. I had him go 20 last week to Seattle. Now I'm going uh, 18 to Detroit. Um, I just think, and it's interesting, both those two teams have uh, two first-round picks, so maybe you can be a little bit more uh, risky, if you will, with the second selection. But I also think Brzee, hey, plug him in and let him play that you know three-tack, move Ali McNeil to that nose tackle spot, and then that defensive line feels like it's coming together. Brzee may take a year or two, but... I still see a high-end athlete at 6'5", 300 pounds. I'd like to see him add 15, 20 pounds to that. But uh, I, I think even with a single off-season NFL you know, strength and conditioning regimen, we'll get him there. So uh, I, I'm not really worried about it from that perspective. I think he'll be able to add a little bit of strength. Really, it just comes down to being polished as a pass rusher. This guy has next to no moves on tape. So definitely uh, not ideal there. And I think that's a huge catalyst for why he has fallen down boards. But I still think he's a mid-first-round talent at, at the worst. So uh, give me Bra- Brzee. Going to Detroit, we've addressed corner. Now we're getting some uh, defensive line reinforcements and a piece that, hey, for Detroit, like if Aiden Hutchinson picks up where he left off year one, you got to stud the making there. James Houston continues to be a nice story like he was down the stretch last year. That's an awesome piece to have. And Aline McNeil, especially those games where he was lined up at nose, he had some big, big, big games. So you might already have enough contributions elsewhere across the defensive line to buy Brzee the time he might need. So now let's talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And they're kind of the, the big winners of this draft because I just had Anthony Richardson fall in their laps. So uh, they already have a you know former Florida quarterback on roster. I don't know what this team's going to do when it comes to quarterback because it could be Derek Carr. Like I could see Jason Light being like, hey, well, you know, we're, we're making a change at OC. The scheme wasn't great. And that's why Brady looked uh, kind of rough. But now we're going to change up our offense. We get a competent quarterback like Derek Carr. We just extended Chris Godwin. We have Mike Evans. We got to keep these guys happy. So let's go add a veteran quarterback. Therefore, kind of taking this play off the board. Or I can see Jason Light being like, hey, I want a Super Bowl building it my way. We're going to start Kyle Trask. We'll ship out all these, you know, veterans that can help other teams win now. And Kyle Trask is going to have us in position to draft a Caleb Williams or Drake May. I can totally see them going either way. So in a lot of ways, Anthony Richardson, you know, is so middle ground of those two approaches that it's probably not going to happen. It's going to be one extreme or the other. But I think he goes top half the first round. I have him going a little bit after that, which I, I kind of hate that I'm doing that. But nonetheless, he falls to Tampa Bay right now. Glaring need a quarterback. Go make the upside move. I love Anthony Richardson and what he could be. 
now he just needs to see the field some more, needs some more reps, needs more experience, learn how to play the quarterback position a little bit more, and then then there might be something special to work with. So then next is the Seattle Seahawks. We're going to go with Joey Porter Jr. here. Now, I, I know and there's probably a lot of Seahawks fans that have already clicked off the video just by me hearing that or me saying that, but Tyree Wilson and Joey Porter Jr. talk about adding a length to a defense that has always prioritized size and length. I mean, I know, I know, P. Carroll, John Snyder, they have not drafted a first-round corner. Those are prior draft classes. Those, those rules were applicable then. This 2023 NFL draft class, more than any corner class I have ever seen, is loaded with Seattle type of corners. These 6'1", 6'2", long arm, freaky athlete corners. Tariq Wollen was a great story as a day three pick last year. And I, I give a ton of credit to Seattle with how they've been able to draft a Tariq Wollen, draft a Richard Sherman, and get the most out of him. I, now I think there's some luck played in there because who knows, any team could have taken Richard Sherman, any team could have taken Tariq Wollen in front of him. But they were able to be patient and they landed in Seattle's lap. Think about how good of a job they've done with those players. Day three selections. Now imagine that same philosophy being applied to a first round talent and someone with first round potential. I can't see how you pass that up here. So I know this is probably going to get me a ton of flack and a lot of Seahawks fans are going to hate this. But man, I think this is the right move. So Tyree Wilson, get that big, long-armed edge to go into rotation with Nwosu and Boye Mafe and then add a six foot two corner who... I think man press ability. I think he's got the fluidity playing zone too. Pair him up with 6'4 Tariq Woolen. Kobe Bryant then moves into the nickel. Man, that secondary would be crazy on top of the already great safety rotation they have, man. So I know this is going to irritate a lot of Seattle fans. It's not what Snyder has done in the past, but that's the past. 2023 is a different draft. I think they should they should embrace that and take advantage of the single biggest strength in this draft class being the cornerback position and take advantage of it in the first round. So we get to the Chargers at 21. I'm going to go with Z Flowers here. I continue to make this pick. This is like, you know, I'm like, I don't want my content to get stale. But at the same time, every Chargers fan loves this one. So uh, I, I'm not going to change it because I also, I, I too love it. Uh, Kellen Moore, that's a huge OC upgrade. Now I just need them to add that speed wide receiver. I've said this a billion and a half times on this channel. They have been lacking that deep route running type. That guy with over the top speed, Zay Flowers gives you both. And he's an awesome satellite weapon. Get the ball to the man in space and let him make the game easy for Justin Herbert. Uh, now, again, I've said this a couple times too. Now, hopefully this is an addition on top of already having Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. I hope they can figure out something with Keenan Allen and his contract and maybe lower that cap hit so you can still be flexible and make some moves. But you add Zay Flowers and he's kind of that third fiddle behind Mike Williams and Keenan Allen. That offense is about to go insane. So I would absolutely love that. So then we get to the Baltimore Ravens at 22. Same thing I did last week. Jordan Addison. I mean, this pick just makes... A ton of sense. Actually, last week, I think I might have had these the other way around. Addison, Flowers, Flowers, Addison. These two go back and forth between wide receiver two and three, which I mentioned earlier this week in my wide receiver video. So uh, kind of hitting on some of those same bullet points here. A really crisp route runner. Uh, not nearly the yards after the catch weapon Zay Flowers is, but I do think you can get a little bit more out of him. In the intermediate parts of the field, I think they both can make stuff happen as deep route deep route runners and deep threats. Uh, Flowers might have a little bit more speed, a little bit more of a twitchy mover in space, but uh, in that 10 to 20 yard range, Jordan Addison is an assassin. He is coming for DB ankles left and right. Uh, so love to see that type of an addition on top of what you already have with Rashad Bateman. Depending on who that OC hire is, man, this offense could really open up and get really, really scary and hopefully get Lamar back to MVP status, assuming that there is, you know, uh, the extension worked out this offseason. So we get to the Minnesota Vikings at 23. Uh, and I am going to wait on corner. So I'm going to do the complete opposite of what I just said about Seattle. So a bit of a hypocrite here, but um, I think where Seattle, like this cornerback class just screams exactly what they need. Uh, Minnesota needs help everywhere. So at this point, take the linebacker, get some much needed juice in the middle of the field and let's draft a corner later. Also, I would say Minnesota, Andrew Booth going into year two, missed a ton of time last year. Uh, you know, Cam Danson took a big step forward. Lewis Seen missed a ton of time, first round safety. So they have a couple of pieces, literally their first two draft picks last year, missed a ton of time. So with Seen and Booth getting healthy, you know, I know corner stands out right now as a huge need, but I go back to that Giants wild card game where Daniel Jones just dumping it off to Saquon and no one's getting to him until he's already picked up eight yards. This team lacks speed in the middle of their defense and Trenton Simpson will certainly change that. So I would love to see a selection and then later on in this mock, we will address corner. So then we get to the Jacksonville Jaguars and the more I think about this fit, the more I absolutely fall in love with it. Brian Branch would be dynamite for the Jags to add. Uh, well, let's start with something that is not Brian Branch and that's Darius Williams. Midway through last year, they moved him out of the nickel to outside. And for whatever reason, as someone who's a sub-5'10 corner, it makes no sense. 
but he gets better playing on the outside. And the same thing happened when he was in LA. So if I'm the Jags, I'm like, hey, that's a true enough sa- sample size to me. This guy's a boundary corner. So how can we get an upgrade there in the nickel slash at safety? Brian Branch is your guy. Now, I don't know if Branch makes it this far because to me, he's one of those players that even despite the position he plays, he is just better than so many other players in this draft that he's going to go relatively high. That's why I had him going eight last week to Atlanta. But here he falls and Jacksonville gets that upgrade in the nickel on top of a potential long-term boost over Rayshon Jenkins who had some moments, had some splash plays this year, but I still don't think it's you know, worth the money that they're paying him. So I would love to see this fit. And then the rest of this mock is going to be very offensive focused, trying to make the best supporting cast and situation around Trevor Lawrence. So I think you get Branch here. That's that that oh, that would take that defense to another level in my opinion. And then we're going to focus offense later on. And the Giants at 25 get Cam Smith. I mean... What an awesome selection. This would be, uh, some people have him going somewhere in the top 12. I mean, some people have Cam Smith as their number one corner. So because of how good this corner class is, there's a ton of variants. Smith's in my top five. I don't have him as my number one guy. Uh, But nonetheless, I... Uh, a New York team that's looking for an upgraded corner. They can maybe do it another time in this draft, or they could potentially do it in free agency. But you pair up Cam Smith with the Dory Jackson. I think Wink Martindale's got a smile going from ear to ear. And then also, you know, I, I, I the spoiler, round three, you know, Ivan Pace from Cincinnati just screams Wink Martindale linebacker. So last week I went Drew Sanders here, and I think that would be an awesome addition. That screams Wink Martindale guy, but I think you can get something similar, a little bit lesser, you know, lower touted prospect, just a little bit later on in this draft. Get him in the third round, get an Ivan Pace. He can play that same sort of role, and then we're going to address wide receiver in the second round. So I think there's a, another way of playing the board, get you corner wide receiver, off ball linebacker who can blitz. And I think that's exactly what I want to see the Giants do this draft cycle. So we get to the Cowboys at pick 26. Uh, I went back and forth on this because I'm not sure he had a great week at Mobile, but I don't know if it was that good, like good enough to move him in the first round just because of his size. But Tank Dell, man, if you made him anything other than 5'10", 165, there wouldn't be a doubt about it, especially given his senior bowl performance. But you know what? Guy who's played inside and out, that's that's the speed wide receiver I want to see Dallas at. And uh, I went corner last week, and I've gone corner the last couple of mocks. So I want to change it up, too, so that is a part of the component here. Uh, but, dude, Tank Dell, guy who can play inside and out, nobody could touch him at the senior bowl, so you're getting a crisp route runner. And he's one of those guys that can go from 0 to 100 in the blink of an eye, but also 100 down to 0 in the blink of an eye. So that makes him a really, really scary player. Quick out of his breaks, really good hands, over 100 catches at Houston, almost 1,400 yards. So a guy who can handle volume as well. Uh, And ideally, you're getting Michael Gallup uh, to take a step forward next year and kind of get to where that contract that uh, he got, kind of where his play meets that. And then CeeDee Lamb can continue to live in the slot for, I'd like to say, 60 to 70% of his snaps. I'd like to see CeeDee there 60 to 70% of the time. So you're going to take Dell move around, CD primarily in the slot, but when he needs to move out wide, you're going to have Dell kind of fill in that spot. Gallup then fills your possession, kind of contested catch type. All of a sudden, that looks like a really well-balanced wide receiver room. So again, I don't know if the senior bowl was good. It, it should be. It should be enough to get, you know, take down to this late first round conversation. But at 5'10", 165, it makes it a little tough. That said, Six foot wingspan. I think he'll be able to fight off press at the line of scrimmage. I don't think he'll get total 2 2 Atwell treatment because if you whiff on Dell or he beats your press at the line, plays over. It's six. It's six for Dallas in this case. So we'd love to see the Cowboys add that type of element and just basically have T.Y. Hilton <laughs> at a younger, cheaper mark and for four years, uh, plus the fifth year option if they wanted it. Then we get to the Bills at 27. I'm going to go Antonio Johnson here. Another, he's kind of a tough player to mock, uh, but you know, safety is going to be a huge position for Buffalo to fill. It's a huge component to that Leslie Frazier and uh, Sean McDermott defense. And you're talking about Jordan Poyer as a free agent, Micah Hyde coming off a scary injury, wrong side of 30. And then DeMar Hamlin, no guarantee he ever plays football again and if you were to ask me right now I would I would say he probably doesn't so uh they might be down all three safeties you know depending on how the cards you know play themselves so uh they're gonna at least need to replace one of those three guys if not all three so yeah let's go ahead and address that with a player who is really uniquely gifted I think can fit into that split safety uh heavy scheme uh, I'm really interested to see the the numbers at Indy because you know just solid athletic numbers I think just solidifies that he's going to be this mid to late first round selection uh, but also it's the capabilities of playing in the nickel too so a guy you can move around I love DBs that you can move all over the field and Antonio Johnson is certainly one of those next is the Cincinnati Bengals I'm gonna go Anton Harrison I've just been going Darnell Wright over and over and over again so I wanted to give my Bengals fans a little bit of a break let's go Anton Harrison, I mean, look, Lionel Collins was not great last year, um, and Jonah Williams gave up the most sacks of anybody in the NFL. So one of those two tackles, you might be looking for an upgrade. I think in this ideal spot, you're looking at Anton Harrison, a guy who's played over a 1,000 snaps, three-year starter at Oklahoma, has a ton of experience in pass protection. 
that could be your upgrade at left tackle. And then you move Jonah Williams then inside to play left guard. And then that left side of the O-line looks solidified. Just need to get Lyle Collins back to where he was when he was in Dallas. And then that O-line feels like it's it's in really good shape. So that's kind of my mindset here. Or, you know, you kind of keep the door open. Maybe he becomes a right tackle. I, I don't know. Also, those guys have also battled a ton of injuries. So maybe just having a third tackle, I don't know if it's a first round value, but uh, maybe it's just worthwhile having that. But I'm envisioning Anton Harrison as someone who can play that left tackle spot. You move Jonah Williams inside to play guard uh, with some flexibility to play tackle when you get into a pinch. Uh, like if Collins got hurt, maybe you could play Williams at right tackle, something like that. So hopefully that makes sense. But also I want to give my Cincy fans a little bit of a break away from Darnell Washington. Uh, what I'm not going to do is give New Orleans uh, fans a break from uh, Kalijah Canty. Hey, look, Last week was the first time we hedged in the first round. You can deal with the same pick two weeks in a row. Uh, also, this would just make a ton of sense. David Onyemata is a free agent. He's more of a run-stopping fit, so I'd love to see them bring him back. And ideally, he can get back to where he was two and three years ago as a high-level run defender uh, with some pass rush upside on top of it. But that, if, if we were to get Onyemata back to his high level of run-stopping production... That really covers the weakness of Kansi because, you know, he's six foot, 280 pounds. He is just naturally not going to be a guy who holds the line of scrimmage and, and stops running a high club. He, he is not Aaron Donald. As, as much as it is like, hey, it's that undersized D tackle from Pittsburgh. Like, watch out. He could be Aaron Donald. He's not. He's not. So, like, get that out of your mind. He's just not that dude. Uh, but that being said, if you're looking for a boost in pass rush like I think New Orleans is, this guy could be your dude, especially if you do pair him up with a high-level run defender like a David Onyemata. So I think this fit makes a ton of sense. And if they do not uh, end up bringing back Onyemata, maybe it changed my mind a little bit. But nonetheless, then this position becomes that much more important to address. Maybe you can find a, a you know a veteran nose, uh, a veteran that's a pretty good run stopper to pair up with him. But nonetheless, this team needs pass rush. And Kansi's a hot name right now. And I think he does work himself in the first round, if I'm being honest. Let me get to the Chiefs at pick 30. I'm going to go Nolan Smith. I've had this a handful of times. High-end athlete. Feels like a nice competent opposite of Carl Loftus. You know, this guy who wins with his size, his strength, and his hands. Nolan Smith, not necessarily a polished pass rusher, but when he does win, it's with athleticism. And especially as Spagnolo wants to continue to be this guy who brings a ton of blitzes and maybe wants to add a stunt and twist, you know, kind of into the mix a little bit more. Nolan Smith, there is not a guard that's going to be able to keep up with Nolan Smith crossing by their face. So I uh, would love to see them incorporate that in their defense. But this is really a play where it's like, hey, Kansas City is a team that's going to play from in front a ton. So adding edge depth is a absolute necessity. And, you know, George Karloff just then got a little bit better as the year went on. Maybe Nolan Smith could do the same thing. He's also a really good run defender, already proven he could do that at Georgia. So that brings value to Kansas City as well. But realistically, you're saying, hey, in a year or two's time, can we unlock this dude as a pass rusher with that type of athleticism? Because if so, I mean, good luck coming back from down 10 against Kansas City because it's just not going to happen. Last pick of the first round video, we have the Philadelphia Eagles. Back on the clock. I know Eagles fans are probably not even watching anymore. Uh, Bijan at 10, I already had you click off the video. But if you are still around, I really do appreciate it. We're going to give you Andre Carter the second here. Uh, I think this is a combination of, I think, a place that prioritizes you know that depth rotation across the defensive line. Carter makes sense from that perspective. Is this fringe late one, early second round type of guy? Because... You know, there's not a whole lot of dudes 6'7", 260 that can explode off the ball like an Andre Carter and has so much violence. I mean, this dude's trying to run over offensive tackles and also has a lot of violence in his hands as well. So kind of feels like a Philadelphia pick, but also for Andre Carter's sake, there's not many places I want to see him end up for him to hit his full potential than Philadelphia because I think that's one of the best landing spots and they've been a player you know uh, production factory I mean they really have been able to tap into a lot of different edge rushers and you know different skill sets but been able to hit a lot of their potential so I think that that's one of the best places that Carter could go to really maximize and fulfill on what his potential is so would love to see that fit from both sides of it but that is going to do it for the first round of this updated 2023 NFL mock draft. Happy early Super Bowl weekend, everybody. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. Be sure to live, uh, leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. I'm going to go ahead and scroll across the top just so you all can see each pick one more time. But, you know, let me know which of these selections, who falls too far in your opinion, who goes too high. What do you think about Bijan and 10? I feel like that might be a hot conversation in the comment section. But realistically, tell me who your favorite team is. I'd love to get your feedback, whether you like or hate the pick. Just be respectful, and I am almost certain to respond to your comments. So let me hear your thoughts down below. Like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you're new. And again, we have the second round portion of this video coming out tomorrow, then round three on Sunday. So be sure to come back to the channel for those videos. But until then, my name is Teej, and I'm signing off.